Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. My name is Byron Noble and I'll be organizer for the session. You're listening to today's Hand Run Styles. If you experience any issues with the internet connection, it is perfectly fine. And you can log on the exact same way as you did and everything will be normal. The duration of the session will be a maximum of 25 minutes and we'll answer all questions at the end of the session ending off at exactly 7.13. The recording of the session will be on the unless in case you missed anything. And that recording will be available from 12 o'clock today. I have a short video I'd like to play just before handing over to our presenter. There are geezers, grumpy old geezers, and there are electric water heaters. As a plumber, it is important for you to know that you are allowed to install electric geezers provided they are installed according to SANS 10254 and manufactured according to SANS 151. Register for the SANS 10254 The Electric Water Heater online course today to better understand the requirements of this standard. Now at a 10% discount. Offer valid 13 to 26 March 2023. Hi there. Um, it's good to be back. It's good to have, have a chat to you guys again. Uh, my name is Herman Strauss and today I'm going to speak to you about uh, vacuum breaker and vacuum breaker positioning. So a quick overview, how a vacuum breaker functions, purpose of the vacuum breaker, what's, what the standards require, examples and questions. So why, why are we talking about this again? Um, and I know this is a topic that came up so many times before. Now, we recently, in, during World uh, Plumber Day, we had an interesting game at the, at the PRB offices where uh, a lot of the, we, we called it our non-conformance notice challenge. So we had a geezer, a geezer installation, a sample of a geezer installation. We built some non-conformances into that, and then we gave plumbers the opportunity to identify, write their non-conformance notices and so on. Out of that exercise, we noted a few let's say, different interpretations about the vacuum breakers, what is correct and what is not correct, and so on. So that led us basically back to this presentation. We said, let's, let's just quickly run, a, run back to the, um, to the vacuum break. And I think one of the important things uh, in, in going forward is to understand why. If we understand how it works, what the purpose is, that normally does help uh, to get a – or to – well, help, help you make informed decisions, help you understand the standards better so that it can be installed correctly. Um, and yes, we know that if you look on the standards, the, the standards appear to be saying slightly different things, but they're very similar. So a quick reminder, how does a vacuum breaker work? I mean, what you see on the screen is basically a schematic section of the, of the vacuum breaker. You'll see there's a ceiling disk in the, in the image that you saw that you see now the, the vacuum brake is open, it's functioning, there's a ceiling disc, there's a spring that keeps the disc pressurized. You see all the blue is, is um, water. So the water coming from the bottom of the pipe applies a pressure on the, on the bottom of the ceiling disc. Uh, so the, and air tries to enter from the top. When the vacuum brake is in a closed position, this is normal use. The pressure from the bottom and the pressure from the top is the same. So that sealing disc is, is sealing off the water to the top. Maybe it's good to mention at this stage, I use blue as water for the, as, as an indication. So it's easy to see um, where the water side of the vacuum breaker is. Um, in practice, in most cases, that will actually be air. Air trapped and pressurized at the bottom of the, of the, of the vacuum breaker simply because there's no air relief. When the vacuum breaker stands on the standpipe, it's full of air. When the water pressure falls, water will go up a little bit what, uh, distance into the pipe, but it will have air pushing at the bottom of the disc, plus a spring keeping it close with the air, ambient air pressure trying to, to open it from the top. When a condition happens where the, the water pressure is less than the air pressure. If the air pressure is more than the pressure inside the system, it will force air into the vacuum breaker, will force the disc down, and it will allow air into the vacuum breaker and into the whole geyser installation into that system. Let's just try to put it in some perspective, what pressure. So firstly, uh, I want to touch on SANS 198. So this is the standard that, de that determines or the, the standard for all the different safety devices, like a vacuum breaker is 
is one of the components that is described in the standard. So this standard specifies all the requirements that the safety valve has to comply with. Now, as far as the opening pressure is concerned, the standard says that a vacuum breaker must open when there is a pressure or a vacuum of less than 3 kPa. I mean, 3 kPa, again, just think about it quickly, a typical geyser, 400 kPa geyser, run, uh, the normal operating pressure is around about 340 kPa. 3 kPa is a very, very, very small component of that. So if there's a, a pressure, not a pressure drop, that might be the wrong terminology, but if, the, if there's a suction of only 3 kPa on this vacuum breaker, it will open. So if you equate that to water, you can always equate pressure to the height of water. You know, the, the higher the water tower, the stronger the pressure. So in this case, if you do the, the math backwards and forwards, it comes out that 300 kPa is just about 300 millimeters of water. So that 300 millimeters might already ring a bell to you if you're familiar with the standards. <coughs> uh, sorry, just had to clear my throat there. So, uh, Quick reminder, if you, if, if you want to do the math on how this vacuum breaker works, there's a, a, a system is always in, must, must always be balanced. The, the balance of pressures um, equal out, which means the pressure of the water below, that's the WP, water pressure, plus spring pressure, plus the pressure of the spring combined, when that is greater than zero kPa, the system is sealed. When the spring pressure and the water pressure is lower than zero kPa, then the spring will open. And maybe let's not dwell too much on the math. And I, 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 I think it's easy enough to understand that basic principle. <clears throat> what does that mean for the geyser, for the installation? Why, why is that important? So we go back again to very, very basic principles. Um, we know thermosyph uh, no, this is not called thermosyphling, this is just siphling. Um, especially on older cars, lately in newer cars, you can't even get a, a hose into the petrol cap if you want to, uh, if it's necessary to, to get fuel from your, from your vehicle into a tank for the other car that went and stand without petrol. <clears throat> that happened to me a lot when I was younger. But okay, so if you want water to run from one container to the other, you add a Add the, the, the pipe in, you suck until the water comes at the other end, and as long as the bottom end is lower than the top end, the water will continue running. The, the, the higher the difference, the green arrows, the, the higher the difference, the faster the water will run. That's a fairly simple principle, and it's exactly what happens in a geyser installation. So when the geyser is installed, there is Two points. Uh, the, the, the green arrows show, for instance, the, the, the different points, um, the inlet and the outlet, say the different levels of the two containers that were in the previous slide. So if there's a difference between those two points, there's a pressure on the vacuum breaker. So you see the, the vacuum breaker at the top. If that height difference is, um, is smaller than the spring pressure and the water pressure, then everything stays, stays closed. But what happens if that difference in pressure becomes larger? Now, that's typically if you close the water and there's no more water, um, water pressure in the system, then immediately the water pressure disappears. If I can quickly make a thing, imagine you close off the water, then the water pressure component falls away completely, and then it's only the spring component that keeps the vacuum breaker closed. If this distance is then more than 300 millimeters, more than three kPa, it means the spring will open and air will be sucked into the, in, into the vacuum breaker, which is what we show on, this, on the second slide. <clears throat> there's, different, there's different configurations. It depends on the different ways that, this, that the, um, Giza is installed, it actually is affected by where the taps are, what is at, at, the, at the different points. So the standards in, have a, 
a uniform requirement that caters for all types of plumbing installation configurations. But the important thing is, if there's a difference in 300 millimeters, that is the, the water or air wall, more than 300 millimeters with no water pressure, then uh, in this case, uh, obviously, if you, if you, for instance, open a, open a tap at this, at this far end and the water at this end is closed off, there's a 300 millimeter difference. Water will run out. It will force the, the, the vacuum breaker to open and suck the air through. You will notice at this level, this is the only level to which the water drops. Um, because of the positioning of the vacuum breaker, the water cannot uh, drop lower than that. If the vacuum breaker were at the lower position, right, at this level, then water, all the water will run out of the geyser up to that level, which is obviously why, why it makes a lot of sense that vacuum breakers may never be higher or may never be lower than the geyser. So there are some... Um, differences in the way that the standards refer to vacuum breakers, which is not very important as it stands, but let's have a look at that. Since 10252 part one, the first clause 6614, and please, if you want to take a note, go and uh, read this in your own standard. The first part in, uh, specifies when a vacuum breaker needs to be installed. And the second part, part two to that says how the vacuum breaker must be installed. And if we highlight some of the some of the importance on the how, this says it must be installed on a on an upstand that provides both cold and hot water feed and the hot water feed pipe. Okay, the water heater and such stand shall extend at least three hundred millimeters above the top of the water heater. So that's what the image shows. The 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 um, the vacuum breaker being at least. 300 millimeters above that, and it must be on some form of upstand. This clause does not specify the height of the upstand. <clears throat> then you go to the, to, to the images, the schematics in the standard itself, and this drawing is provided, where it shows, gives a graphic in, uh, indication of what it should be like. If you have a look at that, you see that that 300 millimeters is actually not exactly the same as what the text says. Now. Just for noting, whenever you look at standards, whenever you evaluate the standard, the, the text part of the standard always supersedes the, the drawing. If there's, um, a, let me not, we don't have time to get into that. Uh, we can discuss that in a longer, in, in a different session on how to interpret standards or how to read standards, but it is very important. Just because you see an image in the standard doesn't mean that is the ultimate rule. If there's text that describe it, the text does take precedence, which means that this drawing should have been a little bit more accurate by, by giving it that way to show that the 300 millimeters on top of the geyser. It doesn't really make, from a practical side, if you install it so that the, the upstand, in other words, if you install it exactly like this figure, it is not wrong. Um, frankly, it's a good idea. And it's a good recommendation to, to do that, to make sure that the upstand is 300 millimeter. I think we've said that because remember, this part of the, uh, let me just get this drawing going, this part is never, is never filled with water. That part is filled with air. So as soon as there's pressure, the, air, the water level will rise a little bit as it compresses the air, and the top part will remain full of air, which gives an extra buffer, which helps absorb shock in the system. So it's a good practice to have that standpipe 300 millimeters or even longer if you choose to do so. So there's no restriction on the height that that should be. <clears throat> um, I see I'm going to run out of time with all the slides. So I'm going to skip over this one quickly. This is just another example um, that we find in the, in the standard. I think this, this one is as it is in sense 10254 and the same rules apply here where the text describes uh, that, uh, that it should be above the, the geyser and the schematic shows the 300 millimeter uh, standpipe. <clears throat> so how do you decide what is correct? Always consider in, in all standards, <clears throat> if you're not sure 
how to interpret, consider the text as it is written. In other words, what does the text say? If you do find that the text might be conflicting, consider the race of, this, of the text in the standard. In other words, always look at the context. What is the purpose of this device? What is the purpose of this requirement in the standard? That often gives you the, the clear indication of, of how you should interpret the text. Um, that is just a, a quick side note on how to interpret. And, that, and considering that, that is how you should interpret the, the, the vacuum breakers as well. When you, when you look at safety devices, this clause, and to be honest, I can't even remember which standard. I think this one is also from 102.5.2.1. Um, it gives some clarification notes. And this note, again, without delving too much into this, but it, it starts giving some of the reasoning of why the vacuum breaker must be above. And it says the placing of a non-return valve or isolating valve between the water and the expansion, con uh, sorry, I read the wrong clause there. That is a different example. What this says is problems and dangers can arise from defective fittings, faulty designs. So it says, remember that problems and dangers can arise. It lists four examples. One of the examples, you see the location of the vacuum relief valve at a level below the top of the water heater. Remember, that's what we showed in the, uh, in the previous slide. If the vacuum breaker is not above the geyser, whenever the, the water is drained, it can drain water out of the geyser. And remember, even, even if only a little bit of water is drained out of the geyser, it is still covering the element. Um, it can still pose challenges because it can, it can form uh, steam, it can form gases depending on the situation. It can be fairly dangerous to have that water and steam forming on top of a water level inside a geyser. <clears throat> so while standards are in conflict, call it conflict, slightly different requirements, what is important to note is you can do both. Both of these conditions is acceptable. You can install it 300 millimeters above the top of the geyser as a minimum. Um, you can install it on a 300 millimeter standpipe. And frankly, if you want to, you can install it even higher than that. That is just a, some examples that we show of how this can be, how this can be installed. Um, you see the 300 millimeters, depending on where the water line comes from. Take note, this is one of the, one of the peculiar cases. If the, if the inlet to the water heat on the right-hand side, you note that there's a standpipe of 300 millimeters, but in this case, um, it is lower. You see this, this distance. Oh, man, that's not a straight line. That distance is now, sorry, that doesn't look good, but I'm sure you get what, I'm, <laughs> what we're explaining there. So that distance between the top of the water heater and the vacuum breaker in this case is less than 300 millimeters. Because it is fitted on a 300 millimeter standpipe, this is still a correct installation and it will still function safely when the, when the vacuum breaker needs to function. The one other case that we, that we all are aware of is what if there really is no, no space? So, again, without going into, the, into too much of a debate on, on this topic, clause 5.7 reads as follows. When installed at a horizontal distance of more than 700 millimeters from the outlet of the water heater, the vacuum control valve may be teed directly into the hot water supply line. In this case, it this is what it means. It means that on the hot water side, if there's a distance 700 millimeters from the outlet, in this case, the outlet is there, you see the 700 millimeters. In that case, the vacuum breaker can be teed directly into the hot water line. This is what the standard uh, line. Maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll say it out loud. This, is, this requirement is actually only applicable on hot water lines. The standard does not make um, allow or does not make this provision for cold water lines. We are aware of the fact that on a large scale, this is applied, or the same rule is applied on a on the cold water side. We are aware of um, a lot of 
arguments based on physics that uh, it, it would be acceptable to, to do the same on the cold water line. Um, what, what I can confirm is that currently there is a, re a process of re revising or revision, re-looking at the standards, and this is one of the items that will be looked at um, to confirm the positioning of the cold water valve, whether it uh, can allow for the same offset or not. But this is what the standards currently provide. Um, oh, so these slides are just... Uh, the wrong way around. Vacuum offset, unless manufacturers. Okay, sorry, that is the the the, the next part to that. Unless the manufacturer's installation instruction or the local authority bylaws require the vacuum breakers to be mounted on a three hundred millimeter riser. So this is something you can can refer to clause five point seven. But let's the, the important point that we want that we need to address here is the one question. Let's spring to the next slide. Always take in consideration what the manufacturer's installation instructions is for a vacuum breaker. For all components in a plumbing, plumbing installation, the manufacturer's installation instructions is important and you have to consider that. You will notice that um, in a lot of audits, a lot of uh, installations are being failed because the vacuum breaker is installed directly above the geyser. In other words, imagine you would have installed it there could be on the 300 millimeter riser and installed directly there, that it might be non-compliant. There is no requirement in any of the standards that says the vacuum breaker may not be above the geyser. So why, 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 why are failures created for that? And it comes back to the manufacturer's installation instructions. This is, ooh, this is important, sorry. I don't know if I can take that line out because that looks bad. Sorry, it's there. <laughs> In any case, so what we what we know is that, as far as uh, I know, all the geyser manufacturers in the country specify in their installation instructions that a vacuum breaker must be at an offset from the from the outlet, may not be directly above the outlet of the geyser, or may not be directly on top of the geyser. Um, again, please, as I say, as far as I know, all of them does that. Please go and double check with whatever geezer you install, whatever thing, verify their specific installation instructions. If their installation instructions doesn't say it must be on an offset, then you don't have to put it on an offset. But understand what happens. When it is directly above the outlet of the geezer, there's a lot more heat that goes into the vacuum breaker. And I think we all understand and we're all aware of the fact that vacuum breakers are one of the components that fail uh, more frequently than anything else. A big part of that is the fact that it uh, is the heat, the heat that is constantly on that vacuum breaker, especially on the hot outlet side. There's a lot of heat directly on that vacuum breaker. Now inside, as it's shown in the, in the image before, there's a small little O-ring or a small little rubber washer that needs to keep a permanent seal, that needs to keep the geyser safe. Um, sometimes that seal, if, if it's too hot, might even adhere to the, to the metal parts so that when it starts opening, when it needs to open at 3, 3 kPa, um, the, the adhesion to the metal prevents it from opening. And, well, the, 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 the vacuum breaker doesn't fulfill the function that it has to. So again, whether the manufacturers specify or not, it is always a good practice to install the vacuum breaker at the offset. Um, when the manufacturers specify that it has to be at an offset, it is an absolute requirement because the, the uh, standard says that all installations must be in accordance with the manufacturer's installation instructions. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the examples, for instance, that we've also seen is where a vacuum breaker, because of space limitations, is installed vertically. Um, simply put, this is not acceptable. <laughs> you, you cannot do that. A vacuum breaker, all components in a geyser must be installed in the orientation that it was designed for. The standards does not make provision for a, va for a vacuum breaker to be installed in a horizontal position. We we'll also note that where a vacuum breaker is normally not exposed to water. 
Remember in the, pre in the earlier slide, let me quickly get to that one. I think it was this slide. Uh, not quite. <clears throat> so in the earlier slide, we showed, uh, we, we showed you how the, how the water, let me use this as an example. Remember this part of the, of the vacuum breaker is always full of air. And the water will rise a little bit inside which means it's always air touching the, uh, the vacuum breaker. When heat is conducted to the vacuum breaker, if this water would have risen all the way to the top, there would be more heat conducted to the vacuum breaker. It will reduce the lifespan of the vacuum breaker even further, and the vacuum breaker might even fail prematurely as well. That is over and above the, just the performance issues. The la you, you lose the effect of the, um, or the damping effect of the air. If a, if a vacuum break is installed horizontally like this, it means it is permanently exposed to water at the high temperature. It has got no air buffer whatsoever, not even a small air buffer, which will lead it to, um, to earlier failure. Um, and it could be substantially more uh, earlier than, than usual. So this is not a correct orientation for a vacuum breaker to be installed. So if we go to a quick summary, what, what do you need to take away from this? If you're not sure how to install the vacuum breaker, the only things, well, I'm sure you all this, uh, <laughs> are aware of how to install it. And it's only the, 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 the problem, some cases where, where one needs to think about it a little bit more. But the, the summary you need to remember, vacuum breaker, always, always, always above the geyser. Remember that is important as well. Where there is a geyser at high level, I have, we, we have seen areas where vacuum breakers might be at low levels. You can have a vacuum break at a lower level, especially in multi-story buildings, but there must always be a vacuum breaker at above the highest level of the highest geyser. Then, the, as far as the standpipe is concerned, it is either 300 millimeter standpipe or a 300 millimeter above the geyser or it can tee directly into the line at the 700 millimeter offset. Remember, even the 700 millimeter offset, when it is tee directly into the line at the 700 millimeter offset, there is still a small amount of air trapped on top of this vacuum breaker so that there's uh, no direct water contact between the, the vacuum breaker uh, or, or the functioning components of the vacuum breaker and the water inside the pipe. And then always, always follow the use the instructions of the manufacturer. And with that being said, sorry, I see I ran a tad over time. Are there any questions? There is one question here that says, good morning. I find it very often that vacuum breakers are stuck and doesn't open at all. Uh, and by change the hot water one open and the geyser drain, Yes, that is the, 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 that is one of the common failures that, that happens. It is often as a result of a vacuum breaker that, that, that is overheated, that is exposed to too much heat for a very long period. That, it happens when the, when the ceiling components of that vacuum breaker starts um, adhering to the, to the metal parts of the vacuum breaker. Um, when in doubt, it is, in, in my personal opinion, it's not what the standard says, if there's one component that should be replaced at the regular intervals, it is the vacuum breakers as well. Um, again, personal opinion, if you go to inspect the, the anode of a geyser, also considering swapping out the vacuum breakers. All right, thank you very much. I don't think we have any other questions. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add, Steve? <laughs> at the moment, no. Other other comments that, uh, that, that I want to add from my side. I would like to, to wish you all a, a prosperous week. I hope it's a great weekend and be safe in the next week, following weeks. Thank you very much. Um, is there anything you'd like to add, Steve? Yeah, I think, uh, Herman, thanks very much uh, you know, for this morning's session. I think only the one point in terms of the placing of the vacuum breaker on that 700, I think we must just always remember that, again, trying to meet that 
and being above the trade, take that into consideration as well uh, with regards to positioning. But yeah, thank you very much, uh, Byron and, and Helman. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Goodbye to everybody. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this morning.